The Bloodstream podcast is made possible by Takeda and is intended for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. Mm -hmm. Please consult with professionals before making healthcare decisions. Hello, today is April 20th, 2020. That's a lot of 20s. My name is Patrick James Lynch. And I'm Natalie Lynch. And you are listening to the Bloodstream Podcast. To be able to do things to raise awareness around bleeding disorders, hemophilia and von Willebrands and everything else on the day, it's great. So we're going all out to make sure people understand more, get educated and get involved. It's about it's about getting people activated to volunteer and to, to spread the word. That voice belongs to the UK Hemophilia Society's executive director, James Hunt. He joins me later in the show to discuss the meaning and importance of April 17th, World Hemophilia Day. You'll also hear audio from community members who join Natalie and I live on Facebook Friday to share their World Hemophilia Day thoughts, feelings, and much more. Later, we'll check in with our friend Luke on his clinical trial experience and how it's been impacted by the coronavirus. And before we call it a day, I'll provide you with some critical takeaways from the World Federation of Hemophilia's April 9th webinar titled Bleeding Disorders and COVID-19. I heard a few notable pieces of information on there that I've not heard anywhere else, so be sure to stick around for that. Natalie, we've got another loaded show today. Yes, we do. And it starts with a discussion about why COVID-19 is different for men and women. Hmm. The subject of today's like segment, made possible once again by Genentech. You don't say. As you know, the Challenge Accepted show is their exciting web series hosted by magician and comedian Justin Willman. I do know that. Challenge Accepted shines a spotlight on members of the Hemophilia A community as they work alongside celebrity coaches to overcome their everyday challenges and get outside their comfort zones. Yeah. In the newest episode, host Justin Willman Heard of him. challenges Damien, Heard of him. a high school basketball player. To baseball. Think- that says baseball. Oh, well, I guess I just <laughs> wanted it to say basketball. <laughs> Natalie's new to the copy. <laughs> <laughs> We're spicing it up. We're changing Damien's sport. But he's going to get a curveball coming up. It's not going to fit. There's hockey hey, in this one, too. It's curveballs, baseball. Anyways, he is a, <laughs> he's a high school baseball player. And uh, what's, he up? what's he doing? With Damien? He's Where's challenged he to think on his feet. Oh, good. No matter what hemophilia throws his way. Ah. Guest starring professional croquet player. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> professional hockey coach David Quinn, who also has hemophilia. Hmm. Episode seven is on YouTube right now. Sure is. And you can find it by going to YouTube and searching the phrase challenge accepted show. All three words? You, all three words. Okay. You have to use the whole phrase. Got it. Or by clicking on the link in the program notes. Ooh. Now, does he play basketball? Does he play baseball? We'll we'll find out if we watch the show. Only way to know. Only and way. Uh, Coach David Quinn, what what sport does he coach? Impossible for us to tell you. It's not impossible if you go to YouTube and search Challenge Accepted Show. So thank you, Genentech. And on to the like segment. So Natalie, in summary, what how is COVID-19 affecting men and women differently? Uh, So if you're a man, you're going to die. And if you're a woman, you're going to have financial ruin. Oh, good. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you (laughs) next month. Uh, The BBC put out an article uh, last week or a couple weeks ago now. um, And it was jam-packed with really interesting information about COVID-19 and how it's affecting people differently. We know the disease itself doesn't discriminate. All walks of life have fallen seriously ill with Mm COVID-19. Everyone's subject to it. And yet, the virus is having starkly different effects on different groups of people. So one of the most pronounced divides to emerge regards gender. And how COVID-19 is affecting men and women differently isn't just the way the virus is making us sick, it's also in long-term health and economic prospects. Sure, that makes sense. One of the most striking differences that has emerged so far is that the death rate is much higher in men than it is in women. keep hearing that. In the US, for example, twice as many men have been dying from the virus as women. Twice as many. I didn't realize it was that and much. Similar, and similarly, 69% of all cor- coronavirus deaths across Western Europe have been male. And hmm. similar patterns have been seen in China and elsewhere. So if we're looking at hmm. the disease differences, the differences of how the disease expresses and the severity, um, there are teams of researchers currently studying this, but reasons are still unclear of why men are dying at higher rates than women. But okay. there's a couple of theories that have come out. Oh, that's fun. Um, and some are biological, some are lifestyle. And the first theory, um, 
what they know isn't a theory, but the theory as it leading to the causes of higher number of deaths in men. It's like a causation. Yeah. So so it's it's still a theory, but one theory is that women's immune response to the virus is stronger. Okay. This is partially partly down to the fact that women have two X chromosomes, hey. whereas men only have one. And we if you're in the bleeding disorders that. community, you know about that. Um, we hope you know about that at this point, <laughs> if you've been listening to our podcast. If not, go back. Um, so why this is important when it comes to the, to any coronavirus. And did what you does know, that mean, any coronavirus? So COVID-19 is a coronavirus. Oh, I thought that was the disease. No. So um, there are many types of coronavirus. Okay. COVID-19 stands for the CO, corona. Okay. The VI, virus. The D, disease. So COVID, coronavirus disease. And the 19 is for the year 2019. Wow. So it's it's specifically coding this coronavirus. I feel like I've spent far too much time consuming information about this to not, to not have known that before today. CO, corona, VI, virus, D, disease, 19, as in the year 2019. Okay. So All this right. is a specific coronavirus. And when it comes to a coronavirus, uh, in particular, a protein which is made by viruses such as coronavirus uh, are sensed um, encoded on the X chromosome. As a result, this protein is expressed at twice the dose on many immune cells in the in females compa- compared to males because we have two X chromosomes. I kind of followed that. Okay. You want me to say that again? Yeah. All right. So um, in particular, the protein by which viruses such as coronavirus are sensed is encoded on the X chromosome. Okay. Got that? I think so. As a result... This protein is expressed at twice the dose on many immune cells in females compared to males. Because you've got all X. Yes. Double, double X, X, double expression. Yes. Double mint gum. <laughs> double, uh, I don't know about the double mint gum, okay. but the immune response to coronavirus, therefore, is amplified in females. Okay. So, well, do we know that last part or is that the theory that the immune response is doubled in females? We know it because of the 2X piece. Yeah, so, yeah. And how effective that part of it all is. And so we do know the immune response to coronavirus is amplified in females. And the theory is linking, so if women have a amplified response, Mm -hmm. is that why they're not getting it as seriously or dying at greater rates? So that's the theory. Logical, but These are the things we know. Got it. And then we're trying to to link that as a... That also would explain the cross, the the, the global um, the trend that we're seeing. Because if it was lifestyle or cultural, then there's going to be more variability. Although I'm sure there's some information that suggests, you know, so otherwise. So there's another theory too uh, of why men are dying at higher rates, and this one is lifestyle. Um, okay. And gender-based lifestyle, particularly. Um, gender-based so- lifestyle. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to gender-based lifestyle. My name is Patrick, and this is Natalie. <laughs> this is Russell. He's asleep. Uh, so this theory um, is. Um, for instance, like smoking. Heard in many populations, more men smoke than women. Not not across the board, but in, for instance, in China, uh, 50% of men smoke as opposed to the 5% of women that smoke there. I, if I'm being honest, um, I, I don't know what's more startling, that only 50% of men smoke or that that gap is as wide as it is. Yeah, so culturally, you know, some cultures... It's. Um, I don't know if that's insensitive. I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of smoking in Chinese cultures. Yeah, or or perceived from perceived from, anyway. from the way we see it. That could be yeah. yeah um, or the fair. way you see it, Patrick James Lynch. <laughs> well, it's true because like I only really you know even if I'm walking through like Chinatown in New York, I really am only seeing the people who are outside, and a lot of them are outside smoking. And a lot of them are, are men. indoors, and a lot of them are men. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, but smoking leads to pre-existing conditions, which, uh, as we know, is uh, troublesome for mortality rate with COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also because this is a respiratory disorder. So, um, I, and I don't know if that term is is medically sound, respiratory disorder. Yeah, no. But uh, it affects the lungs. Correct. So that's, we know that much. That's my layman's uh, non-medical <laughs> Once again, <laughs> consult medical people. Uh, so... There's there's how um, the virus uh, are sensed and encoded on the X chromosome, mm-hmm. and then there's gender-based lifestyle choices such as smoking, and how in some populations uh, 
the men who smoke are at significantly greater numbers than the women. So these are just theories for now, but uh, evidence emerging, um, there's, uh, there is evidence, actual evidence emerging of how the virus is affecting men and women differently in a different way. Okay. And that's financial fallout. Okay. All right. So what's, what's men, that evidence? men are getting sicker and dying more frequently and <laughs> women are feeling the financial fallout uh-huh. of coronavirus. So lose, lose folks. So the lockdown has already resulted in widespread job losses and right. many economies are soon to likely face recession. Mm. Uh, but unemployment isn't falling equally across the board. Uh, which is part due to the unique circumstances of this particular economic turndown. What do you mean? Um, so in the U.S., in March alone, 1.4 million people became in, unemployed in March. Okay. And that's the largest spike since 1975. And I know those numbers Jeez. have uh, increased. Now we're towards the end of April, uh, much, much higher. But in March, 1.4 million people in the United States became unemployed. And women have been hit. Uh, harder than men with a 0.9 increase in unemployment compared to the 0.7 for men. Hmm. Um, And one way that the current crisis is unusual is that in uh, a quote normal recession or historic recessions, men are often hit harder than women in terms of unemployment because men work in industries that are closely tied to economic cycles such as construction or manufacturing whereas women conversely dominate more industries that are tied to that are not tied to such cycles, such as healthcare and education. That's interesting. Yeah. So yeah. in a quote normal recession, men uh, normally feel the economic fallout more. But right now, COVID nineteen, women are. Yeah. Why? Um, I mean, because they're in jobs that aren't tied to cycles, and the um, but this time other factors are having the largest impact on people's jobs. Uh, one of them being a key, if you're a key or critical worker. And that would be someone who works in healthcare, transportation, protective services such as police, farming, fishing, forestry, maintenance and repair are considered critical workers. So by this classification, 17% of employed women work in critical op- occupations compared to the 24% of all employed men. Hmm. Okay. So men are better protected because of that critical, critical label. Yeah. And 17 to 24% in, in big numbers ends up being a lot of... That's a big difference. Correct. Um, the second big factor is to whether people are able to do their jobs remotely by telecommuting. Sure. And researchers in the U.S. have found out that 28% of men can perform their jobs remotely versus 22% of women. Hmm. And similar numbers were found in the U.K. Um, so, hmm. yeah, also interesting. And then what – this hasn't been caused by the coronavirus, but another um, gender difference is the uh, gender pay, pay gap. Um, compounds this inequality. So the pay gap existed before coronavirus, Mm -hmm. but it is being totally highlighted um, now with more women now losing their jobs. Not only are women losing their jobs at higher rates, but they were making less money to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a disproportional amount of female single parents uh, creating an even harder hit for this population because even with a job that's telecommutable, they're the sole caregivers of children who are now home from school and home from daycare and um, sometimes can't perform, even if they haven't lost their job or been laid off or furloughed and they are working from home, they they are falling behind on work because right. they are also sole caregivers. So yeah. it's, there's a lot of economic challenges that this, um, this pandemic has put on women. Hmm. Um, and it's also highlighted other gender, gender inequalities too, increased maternal mortality rates, uh, the lack of access to women's health services during this time, contraception, abortion, surge in domestic violence is up. Uh, and although domestic violence can affect men, there are men who, who unfortunately um, That's important are subject to, yeah. to that. You know, I don't want to say it's just women, but women are twice as likely right. to be the victims of domestic violence. And in the first week of shutdown, France had cases rise by a third. Reports are up 75% in Australia, and they've doubled in Lebanon. So, you know, I mean, and and the, the math plays out, right? Like, stuck at home, financial troubles, yep. you know, roles being reversed and things, you know. So it it if it was... Uh, challenging before for particular families it's it's more challenging now and 
and it's unfortunate but that that those numbers are being shown um so for men particularly those in older age groups uh the immediate risk of death from the virus is the greatest concern and for women who are more likely to recover from the virus other repercussions of COVID-19 may last for years to come uh and so this is a lot of bleakness, but the article does. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you know, I don't mean to be bringing everybody down here. Do any good news that we can report? Yeah. So the article concludes with some silver linings for both genders. Okay. Uh, one thing that's come out of all of this is workplace flexibility. Oh. So jobs where many bosses before said that, like, your job could not be done at home. You Friday, someone's come and said, can I work from home on Fridays? And it's like, no, nope, not your job. And we're learning that, yeah, maybe your job can, can be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I would like to think that has a good chance of being something that sticks around because there's uh, there's benefit both ways. You know, employers, if they don't have to pay for office space and, and desks and to care for people in a building, they're going to save a bunch of money if people are as effective working from home. And then I was just, I've been thinking about like the ripple effect of that. It's less cars on the road, you know, it's less unnecessary spending. It's just... It's more time at home in your stable family unit, and there's all kinds of statistics to show like the benefits of that. So there's good reason to think maybe this trend might stick around. And translate into the new normal. Also, we may have to do it for so long that we don't have too much of a choice, too. Sure. You yeah, know, we don't like we Realistically don't know. speaking, and, we don't know. And that's the article speaks to that, too, saying that the longer we have to do it, the more likely this will become new normal. That's, of course. So it's a silver lining. And then also it highlighted reverse gender roles. Um, upwards of 12% of uh, the population of heteronormative households. So uh, straight men and women who have, you know, a traditional family unit, 12% of, of the, this group um, are having to take different gender roles. So, hmm. uh, you know, mom's a doctor. She's out doing... COVID-19 life-saving right and dad has a marketing job and he's telecommuting at home and he's taking the brunt of child care and household chores and laundry and food prep and food shopping and um, in the U.S. Um, in 2020 60 percent of domestic child care is provided by women so uh, seeing this shift uh, of 12 percent in gender role reversal due to necessity yeah um is also just like allowing uh the other side to see you know the 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 unseen and unsung uh domestic workload uh that exists so that's another silver lining it is it's probably also leading to tension in a lot of places too but unnecessary tension perhaps you know this is it's adaptation is part of life after all totally um, and a health crisis like coronavirus emphasizes and exacerbates inequalities of all kinds, and gender is really only one of them. Uh, cities with large African American populations have bore the brunt of this virus in the U.S., and of course, as we know, those with underlying health conditions are more likely to die from this virus. Um, so while the virus doesn't discriminate, that doesn't mean that all parts of society are equally at risk. Um, and that's an important that's an there's an important nuance to that right totally yeah and and this article speaks to it um and and if anything it's quite the opposite the virus is throwing health inequalities across the board uh into sharper relief than ever and i i just thought it was a great article put out by the bbc and there was also a similar less in-depth article that npr put out last uh a couple weeks ago now too Hmm. um but people are looking at this, how how it's affecting and um, yeah, both in mortality r- r- rates and then also uh, the softer side of things that that's probably not feeling too soft to many people. No, not at all. And of course, I feel like the, I keep coming back to this point, but it, it's also so hard to really forecast, especially as just a lay person and not some you know global economic expert or what have you, what the long term is going to be because we don't yet know are we at the end of the beginning or are we at the beginning of the middle or are we at the middle of the middle? We don't know where we are at in it yet. So it's just, it's, it's interesting to think forward, but I, I feel like we can't. Which then leads to something that this article is not about, but a forced presence, right? Like this is 100%. being called the great pause. And mm. I like that. And, 
um, I, I co-led a, a women's, a mother circle today and there was a lot of talk about how this is challenging, but that how also there's just like a lot of positive coming from this Yeah, that people, we, especially, uh, American culture, go, 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 distract, 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 stay busy, st- keep that calendar full. And you know, all those things are falling away and like people are being forced to face some stuff that they didn't want to face and then mm-hmm. why they were keeping busy 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 <laughs> yeah it's true. Uh, so they didn't have to face it and you know it's I, I i think that if we can lean into that which is good and bring that into the new normal um society may have a, a really positive shift from this in in the end of course there'll be casualties and losses both financial and human yeah they're already catastrophic but um, I think you're right. There's there's reason to think that on the other side we'll be reminded of some of the the priorities that lose their placement on the list and we'll get rid of some of the unnecessary fussiness and we are all being forced to confront some amount of things we hadn't wanted to prior to this. <laughs> so there's a there's a great test in that. Um and I guess if if we can lean into the test then it's uh a little bit more tolerable but it's interesting it's very helpful it's helpful to think about the full impact so thank you for bringing this article and its kind of richness and comprehension um, to us in such an organized way my pleasure yeah and uh, once again want to thank Genentech for sponsoring the like segment this month don't forget to check out the new episode with Damien of whatever sport he plays of challenge accepted show on YouTube you gotta search all three words right Natalie challenge accepted show on YouTube And now let's hear from the UK Hemophilia Society's Executive Director, James Hunt. Bloodstream listeners, there's a new podcast that I think you are going to love called The Pain Podcast. It's a show dedicated to pain in all its forms. Through interviews with pain experts, clinicians, patients, and caregivers, we explore the tools, techniques, and resources used to address acute and chronic pain. Here's just a little taste. There's no such thing as real or unreal pain. Pain doesn't know gender or culture or anything, right? It afflicts us all. Because it affects so many people in often profound ways. You know, you do a lot of thinking when you're in pain. I think it gives you a certain perspective on life. Definitely did not want to accept it, and I also didn't believe that that was really the plan for my life. I always get through it, though. Always. Visit bloodstreammedia.com and follow the links to subscribe to The Pain Pod on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. How has it been for you thus far, personally? Yeah, it's been okay. I mean, I'm married to a nurse. I I said before to you, um, she's a theater nurse, so she's a surgery, but she's been transferred into being an ICU nurse. So she's dealing with the sickest of patients at the moment. So Mm. it's quite scary. You know, she's suffering of the issues of getting the right equipment. She's got it all. It's fine. But there's always that worry. She's on five nights at the moment. So she's asleep up in the house. So I've left her with, uh, I've left her with two kids and a dog being really quiet. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep this, uh, we'll keep this quick and to the point. And what about for the society? How has life for the hemophilia society changed in the COVID era? It's it's been it's been interesting. We are we've been moving into more of a into more of an online space anyway for the last year. So we're, it's more about you know bringing to people together, putting more resources online, doing more podcasts as well. We're looking at podcasts, so uh, mm. we're taking great inspiration from you. But mm-hmm. we're looking to to use that as a better tool to get to people, just because it's hard getting people to come to events. We have great people come to um, our annual members conferences and our newly diagnosed weekends, but actually. There's a place now, there's, and I think actually the, the coronavirus issue it will bring people closer together, and we will be doing more Zoom meetings, we'll be doing mm-hmm. more Skype calls. Um, we're doing our fundraising online, or our virtual buddies the brunch. Even our chairman Clive, Clive Smith, the inspirational Mr. Iron Man himself, is doing a hundred mile virtual bike ride in his garage tomorrow for World Hemophilia Day. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he announced it today. Um, Ooh. He spent most of the day trying to set up his Just Giving page, but he's worked it out now, so that's good. He's a great man. Um, but yeah, oh, he's doing cool. a hundred, hundred mile. You can. He's hoping to do some Facebook Live tomorrow, so it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be on our Facebook page. But he's going to do a hundred mile bike ride in his garage. Oh wow! I'm uh, I'm half tempted to join him, to be honest. But I'm he's just... off that. But for you, it might be a bit. Yeah, it's probably about one o'clock in the morning for you, so maybe not. 
not a typical bike riding time for me, nevertheless, the start of a hundred mile uh, ride. So may maybe I'll have to just wake up and applaud him toward the end. <laughs> Perfect. He's, he's looking for people to join him about 2 p.m. our time, which is still a bit early for you. But, you know, there'll be pizza, apparently. So that's always good. OK, I don't know how to enjoy that virtually, but I have pizza in my freezer so I can just put some on and take yeah. take part that way. How about as a leader? I'm sure you've been getting calls, emails from chapter members about all sorts of things related to this. Tell me a little bit about that. So we've been we've been building quite a lot of calls. Um, it's died down a little bit over recent the last week or so um it's been lots of query about what people should do going to their center going to see their consultant a lot of the uk hospitals obviously have, have had to move centers out and nurses have been moved to different teams and different departments so it's been about making sure the right information is available so we set up a frequently asked questions section on our website we've been using social media to get information out to people because it's a lot easier to to try and get stuff to them so they don't worry but yeah, it's been stuff about home delivery and getting their, their treatment to deliver at home rather than picking it up from hospital. Um, and it's just letting people know that, you know, this virus, it won't treat you with a bleeding disorder any differently to somebody else. I mean, there are a couple of variations where it might do, but um, in the main, it's just reassuring people. There's been a lot of fake news, but there has been some really awful stuff going around scaring people. Mm. Like what? What kind of stuff? Oh, there's just been stuff about, you know, people were convinced at one point that they were more susceptible to getting coronavirus if they had a bleeding disorder. There was, I heard one person say, you know, can you get it from mosquito bites? And then there was a whole thing about, you know, mosquito bites. I mean, obviously we had that with Zika before, but right. not so much corona. Uh, no. just, it's just silly things. But, um, and obviously there's the big scandal of the toilet roll issue and the fact that everyone's trying to find toilet rolls at one point. Yeah, we're part, we've got that going on here too, which is just kind of mystifying. Yeah. So, but we've had, you know, we've had people that, you know, they're shielded at home because they're, they're they are more vulnerable. They've got comorbidities, other conditions. So they have some of our older community have been struggling to get shopping and to, to get um, groceries and stuff. So we're trying to work a way of helping them and link them up with the right people and, mm. and just be there, just be the community. Become because we are at the end of the day, it's one family. You mentioned earlier World Hemophilia Day and what Clive is yep. doing for it. Uh, tell us a little bit about the significance of World Hemophilia Day as you see it. I mean, World Hemophilia Day, it's the great level. It brings everyone together. It brings the whole community together. And, you know, for us in the UK, to be able to do things to raise awareness around bleeding disorders and hemophilia and von Willebrands and everything else on the day, it's great. So we're going all out to make sure people understand more, get educated and get involved. It's about it's about getting people activated to volunteer and to to spread the word so tomorrow there's gonna to be lots of activity from our perspective i mean we signed up um we we we've made a big donation to wfh this year for um the cornerstone project nice. so what like, clive and trustees you know they're, they're putting a large sum each year into that from our uh world congress um money mm. because it's important you know to support the developing world as well so um yeah world hemophilia day is a pretty important day so we're doing everything we can to, to get the community to do stuff, to raise awareness around bleeding disorders. Uh, and I know I gotta let you go here in a minute. Is there anything coming up down the pike that you are uh, particularly excited about or has moved to digital in the way that you're curious to see how that's gonna go? What's coming down the road that you have uh, some mind share for? We, uh, we're looking at how we're gonna do our member conference this year because it's usually in November. And although we think we'll be okay in November, there's still this issue around self, uh, social distancing and self-isolating, who yeah. knows where we'll be. So we're looking, at, we're looking at turning that into a bit of a hybrid virtual and real event. So we're looking at bringing in some, uh, some virtual presenters and bringing in some, some ability to do more webinar aspects to it. And actually more, probably moving more stuff. We wanna do some podcasts. We wanna get the UK a little bit more connected virtually rather than just uh, trying to get people to come to events. So there's going to be more of that this year going mm. forward. Um, we take great inspiration from you, Patrick. You're doing great. You know, yeah. you lead and we are following. I mean, it's our 70th birthday this year. We're officially 70 years old. Wow. So um, Happy birthday, society. Absolutely. I mean, there's a, bit of a, there's a bit of a cloud around it because we were actually set up in 1942, but we seem to have lost a few years. But we're going with 70. It's a good way okay. to celebrate. <laughs> what happened to those two years? That's <laughs> nobody knows. Nobody knows. Uh, we we lost a few years because of the war, probably, but we don't talk about that. Oh, 19th I see. Okay, it's like the thirteenth floor of a hotel is just not there, and we don't talk about it. We're not sure. It's we know that we started in nineteen forty-two, and not nineteen fifty, and 
when we were set up originally, we were set up as the International Haemophilia Society. So there's a there's a there's a few years missing in our paperwork. But no, it's our 70th birthday. We want to get more people involved. We want to get more members. We want to get more active. We want to get more virtual. Awesome, awesome. Well, James, thank you for the time. Thank you for putting up with some of the technical issues we had this morning. Happy uh, Haemophilia Day. It's because everybody's everybody was getting online now. They're probably doing their shopping first thing in the morning for you and. Well, probably catching up with Countdown or something in the UK. So that's brilliant. Well done. You Thank get it you from both everything. sides. You get it from both sides then. Exactly. Take care. Thanks again. We'll talk to you soon. Definitely. Take care. A few weeks ago, Luke Pembroke, another UK blood brother, came on the pod to discuss his experience in a clinical trial, which, of course, has also been impacted by COVID-19. So let's now hear from Luke. So, Luke, a few things have changed since we last spoke. Most notably, most urgently, the thing we got to lead with, you got a haircut. Yes. <laughs> I am buzzed. Um, what inspired the buzz? I saw some stuff with Save One Life. What, what inspired that, that decision? So, I'll, uh, I'll be upfront. From the, from the start, I, I was in need of a haircut pretty badly. And uh, I tried to do some barbering on, my, on myself. Uh, that you know, go? not well not not well complete hash job of the the back neckline um and for some reason i thought it'd be a good idea to try and do it at 2 a.m in the morning whilst oh, yeah. dealing with a surge of uh of steroid based energy and tremors from the other medication i'm on for the trial and perfect uh, yeah, time it turns perfect out time that uh you know <laughs> seemed like a good idea at the time and i gave it a go didn't quite work out huh. realized that I should probably just buzz the whole thing off but it's become a bit of a bit of a trend now where every guy who's gone into lockdown seems to be like I'm gonna I'm gonna shave my head I'm gonna do it <laughs> so I thought well if I'm going to do it maybe I should try and bring something a bit positive out of it and do it for an actual reason and then the idea of shave for save came to mind and I figured that I'd record myself acting like a bit of a numpty on camera and hopefully raise a bit of money for save one life because uh, I realize a lot of the work they do is about getting out there and, and a lot of outreach into communities that regardless of dealing with hemophilia it's uh, it's difficult enough and I can only imagine with the current situation too how much of an impact that's having so when everyone can get back to some sort of normality uh, the work that save one life do is going to be more important than ever I think so I just wanted something a little bit positive raise some uh, raise some funds uh, for save one life and just raise a bit more awareness about what they're doing and obviously they've got their uh, film series dropping tomorrow as well so it's also quite good timing so yeah so far nearly at 50 percent of the goal and um, i'm going to be running for a little bit longer whilst i'm in isolation and, and hopefully hand off the uh, funds to save one life once my hair's grown back a bit <laughs> All right. So can people find that on, is that connected to your Twitter profile? How can people uh, donate if they're interested? Yeah. So if you want to donate to the Shave to Save campaign, if you like, I have links in my Twitter bio, Instagram bio, and uh, on my Facebook page as well. So you can find it pretty much Great. linked everywhere. And whatever you can afford, even if it's uh, you know a pound or something, every little helps and it all adds up. And if you're feeling brave and fancy shaving your head too, uh, then I encourage you to do so and, and, and jump on the hashtag so I can show other people are also uh, <laughs> going as crazy as me. Uh, well, let's use that transition then. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's weird. It's such a tricky time to navigate at the moment for so many people. But given the situation I'm in with the gene therapy clinical trial, it has just been a whirlwind couple of weeks, I have to say. Uh, so much has changed very quickly, and I feel positive. Um, but at the same time, I'm sort of just like, what is going on? Sure, <laughs> I don't sure. like, I really, despite having all this time and isolation on my hands, um, I still feel like I'm very much in the process of coming to terms with everything that's happened and, sure. and realizing how much of an impact the trial is having on my life now um, when I already knew it was going to, um, but this is a completely unique set of circumstances that I could have just totally. never have mentally prepared for. So it's, 
it's just uh, taking it day day by day, which I think everyone's sort of doing at the moment, and just mm-hmm. seeing how things pan out. Um, but it's it's been a crazy few weeks, I won't lie. And uh, and for the most part, I'm still feeling quite positive. But there are you know elements of uh, of what's going on at the moment that I'm I'm sort of taking time to to process and come to terms with. And is there um, something about that craziness, one or two things that you could share with us or one or two things that have changed since COVID that have been particularly intrusive to you? Yeah, so I'll start by the whole need for me to relocate and uh, I'll, I'll give the abridged version of the story. But as the news was picking up and the coronavirus situation was inevitably becoming more in the forefront of people's minds and it seemed to be getting more serious. I had a trial visit on a Monday. I went in and I'd been on the immunosuppressant drugs uh, for just over a week at that point. And to get into my trial visits, I was having to get a train up into central London and then two tubes, uh, the underground. <laughs> and, uh, right, right. And I started to think, hmm, this is probably not ideal, right? Considering I'm immunosuppressed at the moment. And so I raised it with the trial team and they sort of said, you know, if you can get taxis and all of that stuff, avoid the risk. But, you know, for the most part, it will just carry on as normal. And, uh, and then by the end of that week, I had a call from the trial team and it, it switched from kind of probably not trying to panic me on the Monday to uh, the, the Thursday evening uh, saying, we would like you to relocate nearer to the hospital um, can you have a look into a temporary accommodation? It'll all be sorted. Um, but I just needed to actually start taking a look. A look. Uh, the trial team and the people that sort of arrange all the logistics around it are absolutely brilliant. And they managed yeah. to relocate to a temporary apartment uh, that is about a 15, 20 minute walk from the haemophilia center that I'm attending. So how long have you, as of now, how long have you been there? I have been here for just over a month now, which is... A long time. Yeah, it's it's weird how it's gone really quickly looking back at it all, but each day has felt incredibly long. And I remember one of the uh, trial team said to me when I first started on the trial, uh, it will go so quickly for you. <laughs> and I have to say, since being dosed uh, about nine weeks ago now, it's been the longest two months of my life. But no one could account for the coronavirus situation, which has obviously had a massive Sorry. effect on, on how I'm sort of perceiving the time with it all. But it's been, um, it's been a long, drawn-out couple of months. And obviously, the first few weeks of the trial was so intense with blood tests and follow-ups. And now they have reduced in frequency. But it's also got to the point where I will have a nurse coming out to me on one day of the week. And, uh, and I will hmm. aim to go in once a week at the moment. Uh, it's because they really are trying to minimize my exposure. And then at the same time, realizing that situations in the hospital might change and different departments might need to be reshuffled so there's so many moving parts um, yeah it sounds like it just said up front to the trial team whatever i need to do i will do um you know if if there aren't really choices for me i'm taking this seriously just tell me what to do i will do it yeah. um, i've also been getting trained so the last two visits i went in for I was um, given all of the blood vials and accessed my own veins again, which I hadn't, I hadn't accessed my veins for about six weeks at this point. So <laughs> I'm there felt a little odd in a way. It was strange. I sort of looked up at my nurse and said, I realized I haven't accessed the vein in six weeks. If I miss now, this is going to be really embarrassing, but <laughs> riding a bike, I've always uh, been quite fortunate on the, uh, on the accessing my veins front. Sure. Um, sure. So I managed to hit the vein and then, was told which order I need to take the different blood samples in because the different colored tubes need to come out in a different order. Some of them need to be inverted, some of them don't. Um, and when I've explained it to people, they kind of go, well, that's a bit intense, but it's fairly easy. It's just with my brain being a bit scrambled, I want to make sure I get absolutely everything right before I'm of course. Um, able to take my own bloods from the apartment if needs be and then use a, a courier to send them in. But hmm. uh, yeah, uh, a, lot of, a lot of things to adapt to. Wow. Um, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, being sort of trapped inside means I can't really get out there and, and experience life with gene therapy at the yeah, moment. Because, c- correct me, Luke, if I'm wrong, but I mean, technically at the moment, you are immunocompromised, are you not? 
Yes, so I am on uh, corticosteroids, which affect your immune system. And then on top of that, I'm on another drug called tacrolimus, which is uh, part of the protocol for this trial that I'm on in particular. And that is listed as one of the drugs that, um, yeah, essentially suppresses your immune system. It's usually used in people who have uh, organ transplants. And, um, and from the NHS guidance that came out, it has been listed as one of those drugs that if you're on it, you are a high risk individual. Yeah. So I am looking at minimum 12 weeks of, of social distancing and shielding. So that, that was quite hard to, to come to terms with um, as hopefully things do improve for most people and everyone abides by the rules and we start to flatten the curves or whatever happens. I'm still going to be one of those people that are locked away. It's strange. I was, I was saying it the other day to, to my nurse that in a weird way, despite my fact levels now putting me into the normal range, that I feel like I'm living a life of a haemophiliac more than ever because I've grown up and had those beliefs where I was stuck on the sofa for three weeks. At time. <laughs> right, I feel like right. I'm, I feel like I'm somewhat prepared for, uh, <laughs> for what's to come moving forwards. But it is this interesting paradox that I went on to gene therapy. I'm now achieving normal levels of factor expression, but I can't do anything. I can't go out and test it. I can't go for a run. I can't really do anything to you know, <laughs> be like, okay, what's it like having gene therapy in the tank? Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck indoors as if I was, you know, cooped up on the sofa having to rest from having a bleed thank you know thankfully i'm not actually having a bleed because that sucks but right uh, but I, i'm in the same sort of situation of being you know locked away from everything and and not able to get out there and just live life but well that's i mean that's tough man that's yeah. really tough but it's temporary it's it, you know that this will end and at the end of the day i just need to go through this, the, you know what the trial team tells me to do and the s- steps I need to follow to hopefully get the best outcome um, everyone's having to make sacrifices at the moment so very uh, true and I knew what I was signing up for at the beginning and whilst things have changed significantly because I spent so much time making a decision around participating in this I feel yeah. like I'm really in a good starting place to begin with so mm, that's it, important it, it's helped um, and uh, I'm a bit of an introvert, so I kind of enjoy the uh, the, the the space. Uh, sure, as well, maybe so. not to the extreme that we're forced to uh, take it, but I I do I hear you on, on that piece of it. Um, I know I got to let you run, but uh, one question that just popped into my mind: How is how's your HTC? How the clinicians doing? You know, there's a lot of talk, obviously, about the nurses and medical professionals on the front lines of COVID. I'm curious how the clinicians you're interacting with at the at the clinic, how are they doing right now? It's, it's been, I have to say, a little bit upsetting seeing the, the changes uh, at the Haemophilia Centre. It's, it's nothing drastic and it doesn't look worrying. But, you know, I went in one day and, uh, and the physio uh, that I know who works at the centre was taping out spaces between the waiting room chairs so everything was two metres apart. Uh, most things, I think, are starting to be done remotely if possible. Um, I don't know all the working intricacies of it. I sort of just go in and do my part for the trial and, and, and leave as, you know, as promptly as I can. But the, there are, you know, stories of people who are, were based in the HTC being reassigned um, and, and everyone's having to, you know, pick up slack in different department areas. And, um, you know, it's, whilst they are clinicians and there's a sort of, sort of relationship you expect to have with them, people are people at the end of the day and, and when I go in you know I'm, I'm interested to see how um people's families are doing and, and how they're holding up and how it's affecting their work and and the haemophilia center that I, I attend is a, a very sort of international team uh, people from all over and um you know it's hearing how you know things are going back at their home country or how they're potentially going to have to change the way they work or if certain nurses are being sent off to coronavirus wards and ICU and, and there are stories of that happening. It's, you know, people I've known for a fair few years and whilst it might have only been a patient clinician relationship, these are familiar faces. And then you go into the sector and you're seeing less of these faces um, start to recognize just how serious the situation is. And you just wish that more people out there were perhaps 
clued in on that. And the one thing I will say compared to the way the media respond to everything at the moment is that you speak to the healthcare professionals and they are extremely, they're extremely good at not giving off this, you know, sens- sensationalizing everything or panicking. They're just very calm and collected in the way they talk about it. But at the same time, you can hear from the way they're talking about it just how so, like severe the situation could get and the things that they're having to do are pretty substantial um, and they just but they talk about it in you know such a professional way that you kind of go you know these people know what they're doing they've got it under control but if they're expressing concern we all need to sort of sharpen up to it a bit absolutely um, but, um for the most part people seem in, in good spirits and good the clinical trial team of course have just continued to take excellent care of me good. um feel in safe hands and I will do whatever they tell me to do because whilst patient choice up until a point is important, I think there are certain times during the care pathway as someone with haemophilia where you kind of want the professionals to, to lay it out and tell you what the best decision is going to be. And, and arguably you made a choice that this is now part of following through on, you know, sometimes the choice of the moment is actually a drop down from a choice earlier. And the best thing you can do is continue on the path that you knew was correct when you started it, which I think is the case here. So that it's good to hear that you have that trust and that you're generally doing well, all things considered. Um, Luke Pembroke, find him on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can donate to the shave for save campaign. You can shave your own head and try to raise some money. You can, you can do whatever you want. You got a lot of time in your hands. You just, just got to do it by yourself <laughs> is all. Um, so Luke, thank you. And as things um, change, feel free to let me know. Come on back and be curious to hear the updates as things unfold for you. Thanks, man. It was good to chat to you. And uh, I hope you're all holding up well over on your side of the pond and hopefully chat soon. Happy World Hemophilia Day. And to you, man. Take it easy. Bye. <laughs> The Bloodstream Podcast is made possible by our presenting sponsor, Takeda. Takeda is committed to a better health and a brighter future. Takeda has been closely monitoring the news surrounding COVID-19. Their highest priority is health and safety of the bleeding disorders community during this uncertain time. They're taking steps to help ensure the community's safety, including postponing upcoming educational events, such as their Hello Talk programs. They appreciate you understanding, and they'll be regularly updating their events on their website, bleedingdisorders.com. If you've been prescribed a Takeda therapy and have questions, you can call Takeda's Hematology Support Center at 888-229-8379. Again, that's 888-229-8379, Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we just want to say thanks again, Takeda. I always like it when there's phone numbers in the copy because it makes it feel like old school radio. You know, you got to call a number. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it makes me feel like a kid but um, that's actually a good safety announcement and very appropriate as we now get into the recap from the World Federation of Hemophilia's Bleeding Disorders and COVID-19 webinar that took place on April 9th so caveat it took place on April 9th though I'm not going to get into too many of the like hyper data specifics I just wanted to present some top level highlights that stood out to me and a couple things that I hadn't heard before and felt important to communicate um, the webinar is kicked off by Dr. Glenn Pierce. He's the medical director for the World Federation of Hemophilia and has a long history and career in bleeding disorders. Um, and as he pointed out, information is changing weekly, if not daily. This is a virus that's only four months old. We only know so much about it. Broadly speaking, 80% of people who contract the virus recover without treatment. 20% are hospitalized. 5% end up with a ventilator at an ICU. And 2% die. While symptoms... Um, are distinguishable. They vary greatly between people. High fever, dry cough, difficult breathing, tiredness. There's a great variability in terms of the significance, though those are the four most common symptoms. So his emphasis was really around practical recommendations. So for our community, if you are being treated with a licensed product, uh, it is, again, the uh, opinion of the WFH that you should continue to maintain that treatment regimen. There's no reason to fear a shortage or interruption in the supply chain. Keep in good touch with your HTC and pharmacy. The goal is to minimize visits to the hospital or HTC as much as possible. Reduce capacity. Now, if you're treated with a plasma-derived factor eight or von Willebrand factor, quote, the situation may be a little different down the road. And what he means by that 
is there's been a large decrease in plasma collections during this period and that may continue so there may be delays six to nine months from now manufacturers are as you would expect doing what they can to avoid that Nonetheless, need remains very high for blood and plasma donations in local communities. Maybe something to mention to healthy friends and family. Um, worth noting, there were four uh, blood donors in Wuhan, China, where the outbreak first began, uh, that they did t detect coronavirus to RNA. So these were individuals who were asymptomatic at the time of donation, but nonetheless, uh, and there was no ability to trace an active infection, but it does alert us to the potentiality for coronavirus to enter the blood supply. This is notable particularly for people taking cryoprecipitate or platelets that do not go through viral inactivation procedures. Um, and actually to that point, the humanitarian aid program and uh, for many countries around the world where cryoprecipitate um, is still a standard of care, of course, they are at higher risk because it does not go through viral inactivation procedures. Um, <laughs> He emphasized the importance of masks. Masks are essential. We could do a whole webinar on masks. I really would prefer we not, so I think we should all just commit to using them as we're supposed to. Um, and this was something I thought was very, very important. I hadn't heard this um, anywhere else. The risk of thrombotic complications with non-factor replacement therapy, including emicizumab or other investigational agents, so fratuserin, anti-TFPI, is unknown in COVID-19. Quote, it is going to be very important to monitor patients. We just don't know. We have not encountered situations like this where the coagulation system gets activated and the patient has a systemic infection with multiple organ systems that are being damaged. It's going to be key for the HTCs to stay in touch with the hospital and patient, the hospital that a patient is in, and to stay in touch with the manufacturers of these products as well to learn how best to manage the patient. Um, so good to just keep in mind there are some really important unknowns um, regarding this virus that um, if if you are if that affects you something good to be aware of and to bring to your medical professionals uh, the bottom line is avoid the infection follow the protocols wear masks keep social or physical distance uh, wear gloves as needed and so forth um, so again practically doing what you can no need to uh, have unnecessary amounts of worry there are some mid to long term concerns about the blood supplies uh, ability to produce factor plasma derived factor for von Willebrand or uh, hemophilia A or B but manufacturers are doing what they can it's an active situation and in the meantime just make sure that you're staying in good communication and on top of your regimen thanks Patrick you're welcome Natalie thank you Okay, wrapping up the April flagship now with some best of moments from uh, what was our World Hemophilia Day live with community members from around the country and one from around the world originally. So fun. And it was we were, so fun. It really was. It was nice to see people's faces, hear their stories, uh, hear the responses to the questions that we had for them. And we're going to play you some of those highlights in just a moment. We're also going to send you off with a song from Blood Brother, Shelby Smoke. So that will be the last piece of today's podcast. Therefore, it's time to say with that is all for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Shout out to our like segment sponsor, Genentech, challengeacceptedshow.com. Uh, shout out to our presenting sponsor, Takeda, bleedingdisorders.com, to learn more about them, fellas. Thank you all so much for listening. We will talk to you again soon, and please enjoy these highlights from last night's World Hemophilia Day Live. We're going to bring on first our friend, Heather Michaels. I'm muted, I think. Well, now we've unmuted you. Welcome to the show. You do open water ocean swims, right? And competitive pool swimming, but okay, mm -hmm. cool. So you miss Neither right now. Yeah. Miss hopping in the ocean. It's my sanity, and it's not happening right now. So yes, I miss it very much. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to replace that to maintain sanity? Wine. No, I am. <laughs> um, I feel bad. I'm, going, I'm going on walks every day, and I bought um, a stationary bike, so I do that. Right. Okay. Which. It's not giving me the scenery or being outdoors, but it's giving me like raising the heart rate and the exercise and everything. So that part's helpful. Heather, what is the best piece of medical advice that you have ever received? I'm going to give you my best piece of hemophilia medical advice, which is probably pertinent to anyone who's the parent or a mother of a child who has to go in the hospital a lot. So it doesn't have to be just hemophilia. But when my son was really little, like seven days old, little, um, and he had a long, 
harrowing story that you can read on Facebook because I posted it today for World Hemophilia Day. But anyway, he was in the hospital in Hawaii and they were having to do his factor infusions in his head through a vein in his head. And I couldn't stand watching it because they were doing it a couple times a day. So every time they would come in to do his infusion in his head, I would leave the room because I couldn't stand watching it. And one of the um, pediatric hematologists there in Hawaii went out and gave me this very stern talk that I'm his mother and I should not be walking out on my child when he needs me for something that he's going to need all his life because I'm not seeming supportive. And I was kind of offended at the time, but I went in and I sat with him as he was crying while they're infusing in his head, but it made sense to me. And the doctor later apologized to me because it was sort of like in the moment that he wasn't he could have maybe worded it a little nicer, but he wanted to make the point that this is now my son's life and it's not going away and there's not a cure and I need to be a part of it and not step out every time. So that to me was my most important medical advice. Hi, Max Feinstein. How are you, sir? All right. To be perfectly honest, I've been sheltering in place with my wife. Uh, she's been making masks for our friends in the medical community. But it's, it's nice, you know how it is, a, a woman who married to a hemophiliac or in the hemophilia community is likely somewhat of a crusader themselves. So it's nice that she has a project to throw herself at that makes her feel uh, like she's using her time wisely. For well, sure, which she most certainly is if that's what she's using it for. Is she someone who sews outside of pandemics or? The first time in years. Okay. She got her hands on a sewing machine. She was doing the first few by hand, and, and now she's got a sewing machine, and, and, and just off she goes. Just whipping them out. <laughs> yeah. Well, she was, um, Natalie was um, missing out on her sewing machines currently under repair, and she was like, you know, I haven't really had inspiration to use it in quite some time. This would be perfect, but we don't have it. I literally dropped, times. dropped it off at the repair shop beginning of March. Yep. And... I hadn't used it in probably 10 years and I dug it out of the closet. And I was like, Oh, this piece is broken. I'm going to go, go get this repaired. And what then of course, it? like the one time I would use it. <laughs> nope. 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 Timing wow. wasn't on our side there. It is nice though. Creativity does kind of percolate a bit um, when there's not much else to percolate. How about for, for you as a musician and an artist, you, you've been sending me comics. You've been working a lot on your creativity as well during this time. It's fun to see that part of it grow. I've been writing a lot there. I've, I've been working, most of my time has been working towards getting a home office situation going for, for the music. Um, I had a lot of sessions and a lot of gigs and stuff. I, I kind of watched, you know, in the blink of an eye over a week, 64 dates just kind of vanish. So like, you know, just, yeah. just figuring out what to do with the time, but also feeling a bit of gratitude towards not feeling like I have to be part of this rat race that, that I've sort of absorbed myself in for the last decade. Hmm. Say more about that. Well, as a creative and as somebody who generally works for himself, uh, you can feel like if you aren't working 36 hours a day, you're slacking off and it can be really uh -huh. easy to beat yourself up over it. Sure. So, sure. In a lot of ways, I've seen people call this the great equalizer, um, not necessarily just because of everyone's workload kind of going out. Like one of my mentors is um, in a very high profile band and he was getting ready to do a string of festival dates with the Foo Fighters. And now that's not happening. So like, you know, he's just as unemployed as I am right now. But also it seems like a lot of people who just get to go about their lives normally might be in a state of agitation or dread that somebody with a chronic disorder might more regularly find themselves in. So in both of those ways, it's somewhat of an equalizer. So Max, for you, what has, uh, what's been a quarantine hack that's bubbled up from the great equalizer that's forced, uh, forced this pause upon us all? Not just for when. I have had the unfortunate situation of I've, I've been having nosebleeds quite regularly throughout the quarantine and mm -hmm. I've had my reval uh, postponed until such a time that I can see my hematologist in person. So I'm not in a big rush to deal with this. I'm sure you Patrick know just as well as I do that. Uh, you know, it's a nosebleed is rather than dangerous, just kind of more inconvenient and unsightly than anything. So I'm just dealing with this 
in the moment, we're working with what we have and, and it's not really something I'm in a rush to deal with until I can deal with it properly. So you're just sticking tampons up there. Exactly. <laughs> I got to tell you, they work like a charm. <laughs> very absorbent. That's very absorbent. Resourceful yeah. up, Max. <laughs> that, that's sort of the one hack I've learned is that that's the, the easiest way to deal with a nosebleed for me. Um, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, I mean, this kind of fits right along those lines. Would you say that's the best piece of medical advice you've ever gotten? Or is there <laughs> another what I sort of came on to on my own. Uh, the best uh -huh. piece of medical advice I think I ever got was, I would say about 14 years ago when my elbow first became a target joint and it really, really, really threw me for a loop. It was was to try and find ways to manage my stress because stress can trigger, uh, you know, or exacerbate hemophilic episodes even more. So to, to find ways to manage my stress, especially, you know, now during this time of sort of, I guess I would call it an impotent existence. Uh, you know, it's, it's been important for me to really manage my stress and to not inflict it on other people or to allow myself to communicate that I'm in a place of distress without uh, letting it take me over as best as I'm able. So to not sweat it in the sense of you're only going to make the problem worse has mm -hmm. been an important thing for me to internalize. And thankfully, over the last decade or so of trying to put that into practice, it's allowed me to get less and less upset about the nosebleeds as they happen. Do you have any specific tip? Like you said, over the last decade, you've put that into practice. Do you have any specific tips for when those feelings come on, like uh, how you've been able to recognize them and uh, put that letting go of that into practice specifically? Um, I perhaps, and this sort of plays into what Heather was talking about, about how the regular life of a hemophiliac may not exactly be tactful. You know, he, she said that, you know, the doctor was not exactly tactful in that moment, but over my entire life, I, I've accepted and tried to embrace that hemophilia isn't exactly the most tactful of disorders. So I've tried to lean into my sense of humor or otherwise tried to find ways to make a, a you know, unfortunate or frustrating situation entertaining for myself. <laughs> okay. I yeah. like that. Uh, my wife is incredibly supportive of these uh, sometimes strange bouts of self-expression I find myself in. And uh, I mean, that's that's kind of what she signed up for. So I'm grateful for that. But uh, you tell her when you just go, look, this is what you signed up for. That's how you put it. You go, there's no tact in the life of a guy with hemophilia. This is what you signed up for. Well, like strange bouts of self-expression. I like that. That was very term. well put. That was very, very well put. <laughs> example, I have a character in my comic strip who is just kind of a blood clot who's here for everything. And he <laughs> he just like, he's to me this sort of lampoon on uh, what might be a strange way of trying to create content for a subset of a population, in this case, the hemophilia community. And oftentimes it can be unceremonious and tone deaf and... And she doesn't care for him, but she understands why he's there. With the countdown mural, you're on in three, two, one. Hello, sir. How are you? Hey, Patrick. Hey, Natalie. Happy Hi. World uh, Hemophilia Day. Good to see Happy you. Happy World Hemophilia Day. Happy World Hemophilia Day. I like your tapestry. <laughs> yeah, it is from India. It's very um, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. On a, uh, on, a, on a positive note, we've been talking about the skills that this time forces one to develop. Uh, have you developed a quarantine hack that you can share? A quarantine hack, uh, like Heather said earlier, it was learning Zoom. I had thought Zoom was only uh, paid, uh, paid for service and it could only be, you know, you had to have an account, you know, a billable, subscribable account. But then I found out that uh, they have opened it up uh, to everybody uh, and there was a basic Zoom for, you know, that allowed you to be on for 40 minutes. That was good enough. How I used it is to meet, uh, uh, there is a community that we are, uh, my wife and I, we are uh, close to in the, in the Chicago area. So we get together on Zoom. Um, there is a... Uh, I don't know what it's called. Um, you know, there, there you, you sing songs and then, uh, you know, uh, snippets of the songs, like Indian songs. And 
the where you end the song the the next person picks up the last letter of that song and sings the song so we have done all these type of things on zoom um all the kids uh, all the kids met, uh, met on zoom uh, i know you can change the background and some of the uh, students that i went to uh, in india uh, before i came here they're all around here too so we had a zoom there most interestingly with everybody in the rally right and and most interestingly i have some i've been here for 30 over 30 years and i have some cousins who were born after i left india and i have never seen them i have mm-hmm. heard that they exist basically <laughs> so i so uh, and they and so this was an opportunity i said i have a little more time in fact i have a lot more time uh, i do work uh, but i have a lot more time said so like yeah let's start uh, uh, let's let's uh, make a a zoom call and have everybody so learning to use zoom and my niece's birthday is today so that's that's the next call to make tonight Happy we birthday have to your niece All right, so we got another musical blood brother coming up who's actually ready to share a bit of his musical talents. Shelby Smoke is coming in in 3 2 1 unmuted. Shelby, happy World Hemophilia Day. How are you? Happy World Hemophilia Day. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, very well. Um appreciate the red tie as well. <laughs> yeah. No, I uh I had said that I was already set up. I'm doing a fundraiser thing later. So uh yeah, this is the setup, the virtual studio. So cool man. Great. Well, so yeah, what are you sharing? What do you have prepared? Uh, I thought I'd do a song. A lot of my songs are are born out of hemophilia uh <clears throat> in various ways. So the first one I'm going to or one that I'll do and then we can maybe chat. But uh, you know, I think like when you're in crisis and you have a lot of questions, there's a lot of pondering and you're wondering, you know, what's going on. So this is a song uh I released maybe about 4 or 5 months ago. did a video for it but it's called Hey There Devil uh kind of making fun of it and I'll give uh a credit to young Goodman Brown Nathaniel Hawthorne Hawthorne I've always liked that story how you just kind of walk with the devil and have a little conversation so here we go <laughs> Can you hear that All right Let's go Hey there devil Where have you been I've been trying to keep from sin I hear you knocking on my doorstep I see you lurking in the shadows Once again Don't need your money Don't want your fame But is it you who that brings this pain Test my metal and test my reason Is it you or him Is some kind of game I see you lurking in the shadows I hear you knocking on the doorstep once again That was really beautiful, man. Thanks, you're very kind. I mean, that was touching. I um 
It resonates. It, it clearly comes from a, a very personal place. You said a lot of your music's inspired by experiences connected to the hemophilia. Yeah, it's uh, it's because I end up writing a lot of the songs um, when I'm down. You know, like makes sense. Eat or, you know, what are you gonna do? So I've got my notebook or my guitar and come up with the riffs and the lyrics are kind of born there. Not all of them. Uh, my wife constantly says, "When are you gonna write a happy upbeat song?" <laughs> <laughs> We're still waiting. It's coming right up. Uh, well, do you have another one that's maybe not so happy and upbeat, but you'd like to share? Yeah, I, I don't have the happy upbeat one. Um, this one, we like the moody stuff anyway over here. <laughs> this one is um, for my father. Uh, he passed away from cancer about ten years ago. It's called Promises. Um. Promises we make, promises we break, fade out in time, fade out in time. Thank you. 